Unnatural terror lurks among the trees and within the mountains. When hunters go out to bring back meat and trophies, they may just find themselves the meat being dragged back by something monstrous. Welcome to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, here to read you some very scary and allegedly true stories of the unexplained. Today's episode features terrifying hunting stories. Enjoy, and don't forget to send me your scary stories of the unexplained at eeriecast.com forum, so I can feature them in a future episode. Be sure to leave a rating for Unexplained Encounters on Spotify and Apple Podcasts to help us reach more creatures out there. Now, let's begin. The Snow Stalker from Oscar M. I believe there's something the government is hiding from us, something in the national and state forests. I believe I've seen exactly the abominations that they hide. It's not as safe in the woods, at least certain parts, as they say. If you find yourselves in the worst parts, you might be hunted. This is my story. When I graduated high school, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do out of school. I decided to take a break, figure life out for a while. This gave me plenty of free time to go out and do what I loved most, which was hunting. I grew up hunting and fishing my whole life. Starting at a very young age, I would follow my father into the woods with a rifle taller than I was. I would fight through the pine bows as they whipped back at me from my father pushing through them. I've seen countless animals in the wild, and I've been taught what to look for, listen for, and smell for. I grew up in the woods. It's second nature to me. My house abuts a state forest, an hour and a half away from the White Mountain National Forest. The forest surrounds a bald mountain with an abandoned fire tower at the top. Because of my property's location to the forest, the wildlife around my house was always plentiful. Most of the time when I wanted to go hunting, I would just step out the back and hunt on the old logging roads that intersected the forest like a giant cobweb. I knew the region well, and I was always wary, staying off the protected land as it was illegal to hunt on. I didn't want to risk forfeiting my greatest pastime. I always tended to stay away from the border, though. It always gave off a weird aura, like there was a dark haze staring right at the property line. Looking into the forest, it always seemed like it would swallow you up. The canopy seemed thicker due to its old growth. The trees were immense and gnarled, dotted with disease and fungus, making it so the light barely made it through the dense leaf layers casting discolored shadows that danced and creeped along the forest floor. The brush was entangled within itself, like barbed wire. Not only was it physically impregnable, but visually, it was like looking at a wall. All you could see was a few feet into the undergrowth, only able to pick up glimpses of movement, never really able to focus on what you might have seen. But no matter how thick it was, I always felt like something was watching me from there. I never felt at ease whenever I was within eyeshot of that forest. Now, deer season up here starts in the late fall for muzzleloader and later for rifle. Still being earlier in the season, I had a muzzleloader to go out with. For those who don't know what a muzzleloader is, it's basically a musket. You have to ramrod powder and bullet down the barrel. Then you have to set a primer in the breech to be able to set off the gun. This was all I carried into the woods. Traveling light was always a good bet, having less to carry out, especially if you're dragging 200 pounds of dead weight behind you. It was the first big snowfall of the year, and with it comes a nice change of pace. Because of the fresh snow, you can track deer very easily. All you had to do was come across some tracks, I was taught the best way to go about this was to cover as much ground as possible. I hopped into my car that day, hitting the back roads. I was slow rolling with my window down so that my breath wouldn't fog up the glass. I kept an eye out for any disturbances in the freshly fallen snow. 
I drove for hours, looking for tracks, and I didn't see any. I figured all the deer had bedded down. Perhaps the weather made them not want to move as much. I was about to call it quits when I turned down the last road on my usual route. There in the snow, crossing the road, were deer tracks. Finally, I thought, I got out of my car to investigate further. The tracks were splayed out and left a deep impression, meaning it was a decently sized deer, likely a buck. I followed the tracks to the edge of the road and looked where they wandered off to. I realized they were going the wrong way, straight into the state forest. Now, since this wasn't the main entrance to the forest, there were no signs, except for one old tattered washed out posted sign, barely visible. Usually, I would have passed up the opportunity, but this season had just been a bust. I had several game cameras out in my usual spots with no signs of life, and I hadn't seen any other signs until that day. Seeing this fresh sign made me mull over my options. I really wanted a chance at this deer. In my naivete, I thought of excuses I could tell anyone who confronted me. With a few cheap explanations concocted, I decided to give it a shot. I would park on the other side of the road, not to mention it was a very rural road. No one should be back here anyway, I told myself. It was decided then. I pulled off to the side of the road and prepared to go out and track this deer. I got out, put on my camouflage, and sprayed myself down with scent neutralizer. If I happened to come in upwind, my scent would be masked. I also dipped a rag in some doe estrus and had it tied up to my boot so I could drag it behind me. I would leave a scent trail of my own that no self-respecting buck in rut could resist. I then grabbed my muzzle loader, put in a primer, and stuffed a few extra rounds, powder, and primers into my pocket. I headed out and started to track this deer, walking extremely quietly. Every step was a calculated one. The less noise, the better. As I watched the ground, I noticed it was starting to snow again. You could hear the snow crackle as it landed, the edge of my vision being washed out by the flakes. Luckily, it wasn't enough to mask the tracks I was following, but it was just enough to hinder my senses. I figured this would allow me to close the distance on the deer even further. The perfect storm was coming together. The environment was perfect to hunt. I felt in my element. I started down the tracks once more, following the trail, deeper into the bush, enveloped in the mindset of a hunter, stopping, listening, looking, then a step forward, rinse and repeat. As I went along the tracks, I noticed something. The deer seemed to be speeding up. The tracks became elongated. The well-defined hoof prints started to drag into the snow, strides becoming farther and faster, then less carefully placed in lieu of speed. It started as a trot, then developed into a full-on bounding, if I had to guess, something may have spooked it, and I began to worry that I'd given myself away. I was upset. The snow around my collar melted as I got red in the face. I needed to sit for a moment, think of how I messed up this hunt. I picked a tree and sat against it, so I could break up my silhouette. I sat there for a while, letting myself cool off. I replayed my walk into the woods, analyzing every little thing I did. The weather hadn't stopped and soon I was covered in a dusting of snow. As I sat there, I began to hear something. I strained my ears to listen over the snow that settled on my coat. The falling snow had a deafening silence to it, but I could definitely hear something. Movement from my left, the faintest crunching of snow and the snapping of frozen underbrush. Something was coming my way. My heart skipped a beat. I instantly started to sit up. Probably a deer. Probably the deer I'd been tracking. I was hoping it had circled back to get upwind, believing me to be a doe from the rag I'd tied to my boot. The view I had from my spot wasn't the best. Several trees were in the way. But it was good enough to get a shot. I tried to stay as still as possible. Too much movement could spoil the hours I've been out. My anticipation was killing me. I couldn't wait to see it. 
These seconds felt like hours, anticipation shooting a jolt down my spine, making me sweat. From the white curtain of snow that made up the edge of my vision, I could see branches starting to give a glimpse of antlers. This deer was a prize. I could barely see anything, but I could already count at least eight points, standing high off the ground. I picked up and steadied my muzzle loader on my knee. I wanted to wait for it to come closer, so I could make a more decisive shot. My heart pounded. I was raging with buck fever, adrenaline coursing through me as I waited. I was practically vibrating with excitement. It wandered closer and closer into view, and with each step it came closer, I realized something. It was dragging its back leg. It was already injured. I could hear it raking the ground with its leg, pulling leaves and debris along with it. Wait a minute. No, it wasn't its leg. My blood ran cold, stomach turning in knots. This thing wasn't a deer. In fact, I'd never seen anything like it. I wasn't sure what it was. My excitement turned into fear. It was like I turned into a scared little boy again, afraid of what might be under my bed. I could sense malicious energy coming off the thing. It wasn't right. It couldn't be real. Whatever it was, it didn't seem of this earth. It was unholy as if sent straight from hell to torment us. I froze up, my only hope being that the snow had fallen enough to blend my form into the landscape. I could now see it more clearly. It did have antlers, but it was no deer. Its back was to me, hunched over, and it was dragging... Ah, uh, the poor thing. It was dragging the thing that had brought me here in the first place. The body of the deer I believe I was tracking. It was eviscerated, gored and slashed about, ribs splintered and twisted. It was dragging it from its hind leg, its other legs snapped and splayed about. The side of its head was completely caved in. This deer hadn't just died, it had died in anguish. I watched as this beast heaved the deer through the woods leaving a trail of blood and bile as it went. It stood on a powerful yet thin frame, emaciated but strong. The tendons flexed under its skin as it walked. It was as if the skin was the only thing holding it together. Its spine and ribs were exposed in spots, like the flesh was torn from its body but never healed, perpetually rotten. You could see the shoulder blades and muscles contort, as it pulled what remained of the deer along. Then, with one arm still on the deer, it wheeled about. It was grotesque, covered in patchy fur and flesh. Its claws were long and dripped with flesh blood. As my eyes followed the outline of its lean body, I took notice of its head. It didn't have a face. Rather, there was just a skull, none of which was recognizable. There was no skin left to it, just miscellaneous pieces of shredded, shriveled flesh. It had no nose or ears, just holes where they used to be. The teeth were prehistorically jagged and vicious. The eyes, or eye sockets, were so deep you could not see past the brow. The only reason I knew it had eyes was a small white glint off of them from the little light they could make it through the overcast sky. This abomination had no place on this planet. My fear turned to rage watching it. I wanted it dead. I felt, instinctively, that it didn't belong in this world. I tightened my now frigid hands around my muzzle loader. I contorted my body to look down the sights and I took aim at this thing. I aimed right for the chest. I squeezed the trigger and the black powder fizzled and exploded at the end of my barrel, the effect blocking my view for a moment. When the smoke wafted away, I watched in terror. The thing rolled around on the ground, scratching and grabbing at its back and chest with its claws, leaving gashes and cuts through its exposed bone, tearing away at its own skin. It staggered up, writhing. Then it screamed, 
making the trees drop the snow clinging to their branches. The scream was shrill and hollow, sounding like every dying animal at once. It horrified me. I could then see that my bullet had broken right through a rib, and I swear I could see through the hole the bullet bored into. I watched as the monster's head darted frantically, scanning its surroundings and snapping its jaws, saliva spilling from its snout. Something in me thought this probably wasn't the first time it had been shot. It looked around crazed, trying to find its assailant. Then I heard something. It was smelling the air. After a few breaths, it stopped. It slowly craned its neck until it looked right at me. I watched its head as it looked down to my boots. My freaking rag, I forgot all about it as I was observing this monster. Now it felt like it was waiting for me to make the first move. It screamed again, opening its huge maw, revealing rows of needle-like teeth and spitting blood as it did. I'd been found. I sprang up, I sprang up, the snow that had once hit me burst as I turned and ran. I saw there was a dense pine thicket not too far from there, so I ran and ran as fast as I could. As I did, I heard it screaming from behind me. I then heard something smash through the branches above my head. I ducked just in time to see the carcass of the deer spinning over my head. It had made contact with a tree to my right. I heard a sickening pop as the spine of the deer broke from the force of the impact. The creature screamed again. I could then feel the impacts of its strides as it ran after me. My lungs were on fire as I pushed myself deep into the pine boughs, not caring about anything except wanting to get away from this thing. I could hear it crashing through the brush. My heart sank as I realized it was gaining on me. I ripped the rag from my boot and I threw it as far away from me as possible rushing past it until I could find a big enough tree to hide behind. I pressed my back against the tree, ramming my muzzle loader with powder and a bullet, then slamming a new primer into the breech. The thicket erupted with an explosion of snow and tree limbs. I dropped my ramrod. I held my breath, not making a sound. I watched as it bent over and licked the ground I'd run over just recently. It was obviously tracking me. It came closer and closer, every step reverberating through the trees. I could hear it wheeze as it expelled air from its lungs. It had found my rag. It screamed again, making my head buzz as the noise bounced between my ears. It thrashed the surrounding area, clawing and digging for what I can only assume was me. It was infuriated, and nothing was going to stop it. I didn't know what to do. It was obvious bullets had no real effect on it. It seemed insatiable. My options were either to hide or run, but it would surely find me, especially if I got turned around in this forest. I had to make it back to my own tracks to get back to the road, my car, then the heck out of there. I'd have to shoot it, then run. It would be my only chance. As it dredged through the snow, I lined up my shot and got ready. I loaded my legs to spring out from cover as soon as I pulled the trigger. I had to make this count. I aimed for the chest again. The head would be too hard to hit with how quick and unpredictable it was moving. I squeezed the trigger and ran. I then threw my rifle as it was no use to me anymore. It would only serve to slow me down. Not looking back, not waiting to see its effect, I needed all the time I could manage. I backtracked, running through the pines and brush. My face and hands were soon cut up from the whipping branches, following my old set of prints. I could hear it wailing behind me, tearing at its own flesh. I ran past the tree that was now adorned with the gore of that deer. I then found the tree I'd been sitting against before, discovering it was now destroyed. Where I'd once been sitting down, thinking about my mistakes, a ragged pit had been dug out, deep jagged claw marks etched into the earth. I ran for what felt like ages. My legs were hot, my throat burned from the dry winter air. I could feel my heart and my fingertips. 
Suddenly a branch ripped my hat off my head, but I kept going. I was getting dizzy. I could not go for much longer. Then came that formidable cry from behind me. No doubt it was furious. I could hear it snapping its jaws, clawing its way past the trees. I could feel each impact of the thing. It was running on all four limbs. My eyes watered from the frigid air and the fear of being torn apart. I just knew deep down I was going to die a horrific, painful death, ripped to shreds by something no one even knew existed. I wiped my eyes, but then I saw it, the embankment to the road. Just a little farther, my lungs bursting as I climbed the hill, I was spitting up phlegm. I could taste the copper in my mouth from running too hard. My car was just on the other side of the road. I clambered over the snowbank. As I was at the peak of the bank, my foot got stuck behind me, but that didn't stop me. I ripped my foot out of my boot and slammed into my car. Opening the door and throwing myself into the driver's seat, I went to start the car, but I managed to drop my keys. I yelped as I bent over to pick them back up. I felt that at any moment I would be yanked from the car through broken window. In a panic, I put the keys in the ignition. My car roared to life without a problem. I then looked out the window. I didn't see it anywhere. Coming down the road was a pair of fogged up headlights, a green pickup truck. There was an emblem on the door. The truck stopped at my car and rolled down their window. It was the game warden. Out looking for some deer? Great weather for tracking. I was stunned, still in my shock from my tribulations not seconds before. This guy had no idea what had just happened to me. Uh, yeah, it is, isn't it? I said, not exactly knowing how to answer in the state I was in. Well, be careful out there and make sure to stay on that side of the road. He pointed past my car. You know, you can't even be on this side of the road. It's too dangerous anyway. He used his thumb to point to the opposite side, over his truck. Oh, absolutely. Understood, I said. And with that, he nodded, rolling up his window and continuing on, rolling down the road. I was frozen, my hands on the steering wheel, the window still down. Snow blew into my car, which felt like pinpricks against my face. I looked out past the road, and I swear I saw it then. In the overgrowth, a dark silhouette standing against the snow. It was watching me, eyes never faltering, never looking away, as if trying to eat my soul. I floored it home then. I kept the wood stove stocked and the coffee brewed, and I didn't sleep until pure exhaustion hit me. I hid out for a few days, yet every time I closed my eyes, I saw that terrible face. I couldn't sleep peacefully. I still can't. It doesn't stop there, though. Months later, after the snow had melted, my dog had found a boot along the tree line abutting the forest. Not just any boot, but the same boot I lost that day. That had happened miles away from here, and yet it had ended up back at my house that thing had brought it to me. Not only that, but all my possessions had ended up back on my property, thrown onto the wood line. My hat, my gun, which was splintered and the barrel twisted, even the dang Estes rag. It knows where I live. It's playing with me, tormenting me. I'm terrified. It's like it feeds off of my fear. It wants me to know it's there because it knows I'll be scared. I haven't been hunting alone since. Every time I look at that forest, I can see it. Shapes ducking behind trees, lurking in the shadows and watching. I can feel its abysmal eyes everywhere that my lights don't touch. I can't shake the feeling it's taunting me, trying to get me to go back in there. I swear late at night, I can occasionally hear it scream, hear it pacing just out of eyeshot, clacking its jaws, I don't know why it stopped when I got to the road. It could have had me if it wanted. Maybe it did. 
Maybe my boot didn't get stuck in the snow. Maybe it had grabbed hold of it. I don't know why or how I'm still breathing, but I'm thankful for that. And what did the game warden mean when he said, it's too dangerous anyway? Does he know what's going on out there? Don't venture too far into those protected forests. They harbor things that are not part of this world. These places are preserves for these beings, and it makes me wonder, maybe those fire towers aren't looking for fires. Perhaps they're there to keep an eye on other things. Those ranger stations aren't there to be tourist traps. The people who get lost or go missing aren't just missing. Perhaps they've become sacrifices or prey to these things. The unlucky few who have kept them satisfied. And yet the general populace is safe and unaware. No doubt there are people that know about these things and study them. I'm personally beginning to believe that we aren't the apex predators we thought we were. And in this world, there will be things we never understand. The Bigfoot at the Cabin From Troy from Texas It was early 1973 in East Texas, somewhere in the Big Thicket area, north of Beaumont. It was late on a Friday night, my mother, stepfather, stepbrother, uncle, and aunt had arrived at a secluded hunting cabin for the weekend. My stepdad and uncle were planning to go hunting. Everyone else was along for the ride and to spend some time out in nature. I came along as well, of course. We arrived late as everyone had to finish work that Friday evening. It was after 11 p.m. when we finally got there. Of course, it was pitch black, However, there was a light attached to the power pole, which provided electricity to the cabin. We hurried inside as a light, misty rain began to fall. Once inside, the cabin looked normal, rectangular in shape with the main area in the middle containing the kitchen and sitting area. There were bunks on each end of the cabin. My brother E and I went to the rooms on the right side where there was a set of bunk beds located next to a window. Our parents chose the rooms at the other end, and before long, we were all asleep. Around one in the morning, I woke up to my brother screaming at the top of his lungs. I put my head over the edge of the top bunk to peer below to see what was wrong. My brother was pulled away from the bed, standing at the edge, staring at the window. The window was large enough to be visible from both bunks, as I looked, I saw movement out there past the window. A silhouette, brown and furry. I quickly spun around back onto the top bunk, and there I came face to face with a horrible sight. An animal, a beast, with large eyes and a snarling upturned face, was exposing dangerous looking teeth towards us. It quickly moved away from the window. I found myself screaming, and soon my stepdad and my uncle were on the scene. Shortly after, we could hear that creature outside, screaming, and the pole with the light began to shake, until it and the power to the cabin went out. My uncle and stepdad then went outside with rifles, assuming it was a bear. Shortly after, I saw them run back inside, locking and barricading the door. They did their best to calm us down. We all stayed in the living area together. My aunt aggressively tried to get the men to say it was just a bear, probably for us kids' sakes. After a while, as I lay there pretending to sleep, I vividly remember overhearing my uncle say, there's no way that was a bear. The next morning, we hurried to pack and leave. One of the cars we drove was a Pinto, we found the right front corner panel dented in as if something had pressed down its weight on it, and there were smudges on the windshield as if something had been leaning in and looking into the car. There were some tracks around, but the rain had made them unclear. My brother and I trailed the men to the back of the cabin. 
we examined the area next to the window. The cabin was on a slant with the ground significantly lower on one side than the other, sloping down the hill to the driveway. For an animal to put its face in the window, it had to have stood over eight feet tall for its eyes to be even with the top bunk I was in. My dad said if it was a bear, it had to have been huge. We all got in the cars and left, everyone on edge. No one spoke on the ride home. Couldn't get home from Solo Hunt. The hills near my home have always been my favorite place to hunt. I've spent years traipsing through those woods, learning every ridge and valley by heart. But after the bizarre event that happened two falls ago, when I was out hunting alone, I don't know if I'll ever see those familiar mountains the same way again. I'd just turned 50 at the time. I was still in good enough shape to handle long hikes at high elevation. I went out early one Saturday morning in October, heading for a remote valley where I knew I could usually bag an elk that time of year. It was only about a four mile trek from the dirt road where I parked my truck. I hiked along enjoying the scenery and fresh air. After a couple of hours, I reached the valley and found a nice vantage spot to sit quietly and watch for movement. Around noon, I spotted a decent-sized bull elk grazing near a stream. I lined up my shot carefully and took it. The animal went down, instantly and painlessly. I then went on down to field dress it. It took a while to break down the carcass. By the time I had it prepped and ready to carry back, it was late afternoon. I loaded up my pack with some meat and antlers, then hoisted the rest onto my shoulders. Now came the tedious part, hauling the massive thing out through the mountains back to my truck. I didn't mind the work, though my joints certainly protested under the heavy load. I followed the valley downstream, winding my way up over ridges towards home. The sun gradually sank toward the peaks as I hiked. I expected to reach the dirt road in another hour or so, but the terrain soon looked unfamiliar. The path I was following petered out. I must have wandered off course a bit in the dense woods. However, I wasn't too worried at first. I chose a new direction heading downhill, where I hoped the road was. But after another 30 minutes with no sight of the road or familiar landmarks, I started to feel uneasy. The shadows were growing long, and the temperature was dropping. I stopped to get my bearings and let go of the elk, it was becoming too much for me to handle, as I didn't expect the trek back to take so long. I now had no idea which direction I'd come, versus which way I needed to go. Every outcropping and tree looked the same. It was as if the mountains had shifted subtly when I wasn't paying attention. I kept pressing onward, expecting around each bend to see the road and truck just ahead but the dusk light faded rapidly to darkness, and still my surroundings looked foreign. A sense of surreal confusion set in. I'd walked this area most of my life, yet now it was like an endless maze. Still exhausted from previously hauling that elk and hiking all day, I decided my only option was to keep moving and look for some sort of shelter. I trudged on through unfamiliar gullies, and drainages that seemed to double back or lead in circles. As I stopped to catch my breath, the silence of the night mountains felt heavy and ominous. I shook my head, telling myself this was ridiculous. I just needed some daylight to get my bearings again. But doubt and dread gnawed at me, telling me I was trapped in some bizarre spiral, doomed to wander, lost forever. I pushed on for what felt like hours in the cold darkness. Finally, I stumbled into a small cave and collapsed, far too tired to continue. I managed to make a small fire with my emergency kit before passing out from exhaustion. When I woke up, pale dawn light was glowing at the cave entrance. 
I expected to see only unfamiliar terrain, but realized with astonishment that I recognized exactly where I was. This cave was less than half a mile from the dirt road and my truck. Disoriented, I hurried outside. I covered the short distance to the road in under 20 minutes. Reaching my untouched truck filled me with overwhelming relief. I drove home in a stunned daze, worried about my wife Jenny, who herself must be worried sick about me, having been gone overnight. The day before, I told her I'd be home before dark. When I pulled up to the house, I raced inside, calling her name. Jenny appeared, confused but also relieved. She was asking if everything was all right. I stammered, trying to explain what happened, that I'd somehow gotten lost in the woods and had to sleep in a cave overnight. But Jenny seemed confused. She explained that I'd been gone for only a couple of hours. I looked at her, bewildered. She said to me, Hun, you left just a couple of hours ago. Are you okay? Look, it's 8 a.m. right now. Remember? You left at 6 a.m. to get an early start. What? What do you mean? There's no way. She showed me her phone then. A smartphone. I never carried mine out when hunting. A quirk I have about carrying my phone too much, possibly causing cancer. My wife says I'm paranoid. Anyway, her phone did in fact show yesterday's date. Or rather, today's date. That couldn't be right. I remembered then that my truck radio had the date displayed on its screen. I ran outside and checked without a word. Sure enough, it matched my wife's phone. I refused to believe it. I told myself I'd gotten my dates mixed up somehow, though that didn't explain my wife believing it had only been a couple of hours. There was a knock at the door then. I looked out the window nearby. It was my neighbor. He's an avid hunter too. We always discussed our kills and any activity we'd seen while out in the mountains. This time though, when I answered the door, he said something to me that confirmed I'd experienced the unexplainable. Hey there, saw you this morning driving out with your rifle in the truck window, but then you came back about two hours later. Did you forget something? Hope your wife's okay. He just corroborated my wife's explanation without even being prompted. I once again stood there in shock. A sudden realization struck me. The meat I'd kept in my pack. That would confirm that I had been out, that I had in fact shot that elk, that I had dragged it for hours, that what I experienced did happen. I once again ran back to my truck without a word, grabbing my pack and tearing it open. I couldn't breathe when I saw it. The elk meat I'd carefully labored to get was gone. My heart pounded as I grasped for some rational explanation. Had I somehow imagined the long lost night? It couldn't be. Every memory and detail remained sharp. Believe me, I wouldn't forget being lost in the woods, aching and exhausted, having dragged that elk for hours. The meat in that pack may have been gone, but my sore muscles weren't. None of it made sense. I went back inside and just told them both I needed a rest. And that's my story. All I know is that something is in those mountains, manipulating time and space. For whatever reason, for a period, I was trapped alone in a twisted night, and I'm just thankful it let me go. After that event, I changed my hunting grounds, and I never went back out there. Could you imagine going back to somewhere that might take you again? What if I'm trapped in that loop forever next time? Whatever. Maybe I'm just going crazy. The Not Deer That Hunted Me From Sean M. I am 16 and I live in Alabama, and just like the typical southern stereotype, I love hunting. It's my passion and I can't get enough of it. Nothing out of the ordinary has ever happened on my other trips. This specific occasion is the only one I can describe where something extraordinary happened. 
According to my mom, my dad would take me out with him when he was hunting on our private property, when I was just a little guy. Then one day, he suddenly just stopped hunting altogether, like he was completely done with it for some reason. He took down all the stuffed deer heads and skulls, etc., and tried to sell his guns too. Luckily, my mother was able to talk him into letting me have one of them, a bolt-action rifle with a thermal scope, when I was old enough to be responsible with it. I didn't know why my dad did what he did, but I do think I found out during the events of my story. My first hunt alone was when I was around 13 years old. I had previously gone with my best friend and his dad, but this time I wanted to try it by myself. My dad's old camouflaged treehouse was still intact deep in the woods, and I used that until I was older. Nowadays, it has pretty much fallen out of the tree due to my lack of actually trying to take care of it. So I decided to make my own way of hunting. I had just turned 15 when I put my idea into action. I had been playing a lot of Call of Duty lately. I still do to this day, and I was obsessed with the idea of ghillie suits. For those who don't know what those are, it's basically a tactical form of camouflage used by military operators, mostly snipers, that are meant to disguise oneself completely by attaching various parts of the surrounding environment, such as leaves, grass, or whatever was around, to all areas of the body. It comes into play mostly when the user is lying down, or hiding in a bush or other small foliage. If you want to see one, I'd suggest googling it. I'd managed to throw together a pretty good ghillie suit out of my dad's old hunting clothes and a bunch of leaves that I found outside. It was fall at the time, so dead leaves were my best bet of concealment. In the present, I've earned a nickname at school for my unique form of hunting. They called me Bush Boy. I was pretty excited, imagining myself aiming my rifle at a large buck, bagging something great that day. My girlfriend, MJ, always liked seeing what I brought back from the woods, even though she wasn't too into the idea of killing animals for sport, though I wouldn't call it just for sport if it ends up being for dinner. Deciding that evening or night would be the best environment to test my ghillie suit, I left my home at around 7.30 p.m. on a Saturday, a decision I would soon regret. I'd brought my usual gear, my dad's old rifle with the thermal scope, the Glock G40 10mm that I'd saved up for, and which my dad bought for me since I wasn't of legal age to purchase it on my own. If you're wondering why I have that with me, it's in case I don't get the kill in one shot, and I have to put the poor thing out of its misery at closer range. I also brought my hunting knife, a shovel, a flashlight, and a small first aid kit. As I walked into the woods, finding a good spot to lay down, I facetimed MJ, like I usually do before I really get into the zone. She picked up right away and we had an interesting conversation about my appearance. I fondly remembered her repeating the phrase, You look ridiculous, but I kinda like it. When I finally found a suitable spot to lie down, we said our goodbyes and hung up. I put my shovel and first aid kit against a nearby tree, marking it with a neon pink ribbon so I wouldn't lose them if I ended up getting something and went over to do my work. I then got on my stomach, rifle ready, and waited, and waited, and waited. Eventually, by the time I looked at my watch, three and a half hours had passed. I would usually go home after three hours without anything showing up, but that day I was determined to catch something with my beloved new ghillie suit. Another 15 minutes went by, and luck had found me. A huge buck came wandering out of the brush around 20 yards away. The thing was unnaturally tall and looked quite disheveled, like it had not eaten in a long time. The weirdest part about it was its eyes. They were blank looking and milky white. It sent a small shiver down my spine. However, I brushed off this odd phenomenon by assuming that it was blind. But my eyes were on the prize, the giant rack of antlers that sucker had on its head. But the fact this deer may be blind made it more likely that its ears were much more sensitive, making it more so that any movement I made, 
even moving my foot in the leaves would be enough to make it run off. So I tried to be as still as possible while adjusting my position to get my crosshairs right on the heart. The buck stood still as a statue, making it much easier to aim exactly where the heart should be. What was strange, however, was that my thermal scope appeared not to see it. The only way that was possible was if the deer wasn't giving off any body heat. That should be physically impossible. Looking through the scope, it was like the buck was simply part of the trees and surroundings. I could only see an outline because it was standing so still. And at the time, the forest had also fallen unnervingly quiet. Utter silence. Making a mental note to see if there was anything wrong with my scope when I got home, I lined up my shot and I pulled the trigger. The bullet hit the deer dead in the spot I'd been aiming for and I saw a burst of scarlet come from it as the muzzle flash from my gun briefly lit up the almost pitch black environment. I listened for the thud of the deer dropping to the ground before standing up feeling triumphant. Even though my ghillie suit hadn't really been of any use as the buck was seemingly blind, I was still happy I'd managed to bag something this big. I turned on my flashlight and walked over to the tree where I'd left my other gear. I lay my rifle down there before taking out my hunting knife. I then shone the light where the deer had fallen. It was still moving. With a sigh, I got my handgun and turned the safety off before walking towards the still struggling deer, intending to end its suffering. However, I stopped in my tracks as the bleeding animal suddenly went quiet. Then, something disturbing happened. The deer stood back up on two legs as I stood there, dumbfounded. I looked at its front legs. They weren't legs at all. They looked like human hands and arms stained with what appeared to be blood. I simply stood there frozen looking at this thing, terrified at this abomination that I'd thought was a normal deer. I couldn't move. I'd never been so scared. Honestly, I thought I was dreaming. I squeezed my eyes shut, then pried them open, just to be sure. Then the creature opened its mouth. I'll just say this. Sharp, carnivorous teeth on a deer looks completely wrong. It let out a sound like a screech, one of the most horrible noises I'd ever heard in my life. It was like the combination of a younger woman screaming at the top of her lungs and a mountain lion's roar. I was stuck where I stood, eyes wide. Then the thing fell back to all fours and began to scuttle towards me like it was a spider, not moving at all like a deer. Its body and head were low to the ground. It was then that I finally convinced my own body to turn tail and sprint at top speed back towards the familiar direction of my home not caring that I was leaving my dad's precious rifle and other items behind. I'm pretty sure that if I ran that fast again, I'd even give Usain Bolt a challenge. I could hear it behind me, belting out that screech again and again. Eventually, I felt a pain in my calf, but I didn't let it slow me down even a bit. I soon spied the lights of my house through the trees, a small sense of relief flooded me, and I flew across the empty backyard, up the porch, and into the house, slamming the door so hard, the entire house shook. I rushed over to the window, ripping the curtains away, and when I looked out, there was nothing. The lights of the back porch illuminated an empty backyard. The so-called deer was gone, vanished. Still not convinced I was safe, I hastily zoomed all over the house, locking every door and every window, triple checking they were indeed locked after I finished. Once again, I found myself at the back door. Suddenly, I heard a voice behind me. You saw it, didn't you, son? It was my dad. He was standing stock still on the stairs in his pajamas, staring right at me without blinking. Adrenaline still pumped through my veins, and I was still high and alert. After thinking for a moment, I gave him an answer. What? I, I just... I think I saw a grizzly snuck up on me. I think I'm just gonna go to bed. 
I slowly walked up the stairs to go to my room, my dad still standing there unmoving and silent, watching me go up until we couldn't see each other anymore. As I got to my room, a pleasant surprise awaited me. MJ was sitting on my bed, smiling at me. She asked how it went, if I'd gotten anything, before a look of concern fell over her face. I looked at myself in a nearby mirror, and I couldn't blame her. My ghillie suit was shredded, and I was white as a sheet. By then, the adrenaline rush was wearing off, and I started to shake and tremble. I sat near her on the bed, and she helped me to calm down. Eventually, I fell asleep. By the time I woke up, it was 1 p.m. MJ quickly asked, Hey, what happened to you? I didn't know what to say. What was I supposed to say? Eventually, I ended up telling her. I saw something. A monster. She didn't seem to know what I meant, obviously. So I told her the same story I'm telling you now about the thing I'm referring to now as the not deer. Thinking back on this, I remembered something. My ghillie suit. I think it did work. That monster clearly had not been blind, but it had not seen me when I was lying on the ground. If I had not been wearing it, there's a chance I would not be alive today. I'm sure you're thinking this is where it ends, but I'm afraid I had one more experience with that thing that chased me that night. Quite unfortunately, it happened the following evening. This time I wasn't in the woods or alone. I was home alone with MJ. It was around 9pm and my parents were out, likely at a party. MJ stayed over at my house for the day because she was still worried about me. We just ate dinner and were just hanging out. My calf was bandaged up because something, probably that monster, had cut me during that chase back to my house. It was a single scratch mark, but thankfully it wasn't too deep. It was so quiet and peaceful, the sounds of crickets from outside filling the interior of the house. But all at once, all the sounds went quiet. It was like someone had just pressed the mute button on the Earth's TV remote. The deathly silence is what I now associate with that not deer. MJ had fallen asleep at that point, but I was very much awake now. Suddenly, something stirred her awake, and right after that, we began to hear this tap, tap, tapping sound nearby. It seemed to be coming from one of the windows which faced the woods. The two of us were creeped out and listened for a moment. It came again. The tap, tap, tapping. That's freaking me out, MJ whispered. I told her to stay put. As I got up, I'd left my unloaded Glock within arm's reach earlier in the morning, so I grabbed it, slipped the magazine in, and flipped off the safety. I crept towards the obscured window, dreading what I was about to find. Almost standing right in front of it, I peeked out of the crack between the curtains and saw what appeared to be an antler right outside the window. I quickly pulled away hard pounding at the realization of what might be outside. MJ looked even more scared as she watched me. All we could do then was look at each other. There was another tap, tap, tap at the window beside me. And that's when we heard a voice, a voice that sounded oddly like MJ's. Sean, come outside. Sean... It sounded much like her, but nothing like her at the same time, because it was flat and emotionless. MJ cried silently, speaking in a panicked whisper that it was not her. The voice came again, beckoning me outside. By then, I'd regained some confidence and decided that I had to do something to protect us. I turned around, raised my gun, and emptied the entire magazine through that window. It shattered, and I heard that god-awful screech again as I glimpsed the not-deer scramble back into the woods and out of sight. I had to have hit it. I was 100% sure, but I was not going to take any chances, remembering that this thing had basically shrugged off a rifle round the night prior. I turned around, grabbed MJ by the arm, and we went to hide in the attic. 
What I remember after that is my parents getting home around 2 a.m., finding us hiding there. My mom was quite reasonably upset that I'd shot out the window, but my dad seemed to understand. I think he knew what happened. He ordered a replacement window. MJ went home and I couldn't blame her. It's been a year since this happened. MJ and I are still together, but we don't talk about what happened those two nights. I still go hunting with my now improved ghillie suit, and I managed to recover the gear I'd left in the woods during that fateful encounter. However, I always make sure that the deer I'm about to shoot is normal sized, with normal eyes, and actually gives off body heat. What I believe nearly killed me those two nights a year ago was a wendigo, an evil spirit doomed to walk the earth forever, fueled by rage, ever thirsty for blood, picking off those unfortunate enough to be fooled by its disguise. I haven't seen the not deer again, and I don't particularly want to. But deep down, I know that one day it will appear again, and when it does, I do not think it likely I will escape for a third time. Thank you for listening to Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoy this show, think about supporting us. There are several ways you can. Search for EerieCast on your favorite podcast app and follow our other scary shows, especially the other two I host, Tales from the Break Room and Camping Horrors. Leave Unexplained Encounters a rating on Spotify and a review on Apple Podcasts. The more we get, the higher we climb in the charts. Get some cool merch at EerieCast.store or unlock tons of cool extras like exclusive audiobooks and music tracks Add free access to all our shows and a huge 20% discount on all our merch, all for less than three bucks a month by signing up for EerieCast Plus at EerieCast.com slash plus. Thank you. Until next time, send me your scariest stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org so I can narrate them in a future episode. And follow me on X, formerly Twitter, at Dark Prevails for plenty of screams and memes. Stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.